So we hope that in today's webinar you will learn um, why you may need a zoning model and how this can help you with your security design, how to translate the customer's requirements into a good security design, how to apply the technologies that are available to you today and apply that to the zoning model that we're going to introduce you to. And we're going to talk about some additional security measures that you can apply once you've completed your uh, zoning model. So let's look at the zoning model then in a bit more detail. And the goal of having a good zoning model is to create a layered security concept which fits the needs and the budget of the customer. The layered security, uh, security approach is a very crucial part of any design and it's something that a lot of consultants will be very familiar with. We don't want the company's most valuable assets to be accessible to potential threats. So we want to make it as difficult and time consuming for potential attackers to enter the building and potentially gain um, access to our most valuable assets. A zoning model will help you achieve that. We also have to remember that for a lot of customers, it's very important for its employees and visitors to also have a good experience, a good visitor experience when using the building as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a balance that we always have to take into consideration. And it's the challenge for you as, as integrators, as partners and consultants to create a security design which meets the requirements for both security and costs. If you have a design or if you design a system that's too expensive, your customer will not have the budget um, to procure um, all of that technology and may look for an alternative solution elsewhere. If you design a system that is not secure enough, your customer's property may be at risk. So the goal of a zoning model is to have a structured way to determine which measures you can apply and where in the most cost effective way. Another challenge you may face is the customer needs to be able to work with the system. If you make it too complex for the customer, they will not be able to use the system properly or they could potentially lose interest. For example, if you create too many alarms and notifications in the system, the security managers will not be able to process all of those and eventually they could turn them off and this could prove fatal in case of an emergency. So you have to really design a system which is easy to use and is understandable for the customer, but it has the right amount of functionality inside the uh, system. So you have to deal with the challenges of security versus costs and simple versus complex. Therefore, we think at NEDAP that uh, a zoning model can help. All right, this model will give you a structured way of working without, without having to reinvent the wheel each time. You can apply this model over and over again uh, uh, for each project that you may do. And it's our experience that if you use this model as a starting point, you'll automatically be more critical on which measures you can apply and where. And as new technology and new solutions become available, you can easily fit those in to your designs at a later point. It's important to understand that this is just a need app model and it's not a standard like EN 5600, for example, which uses a zoning model for data centers, but it follows along those lines. The next thing that you'll always need for, for your security design is a risk assessment before you begin. Before you can make the right decisions to deal with the challenges, you need to know what you need to protect and what you're protecting against. What, what does the customer need a security system for? What's it trying to solve? What problem is it trying to solve? The risk assessment is typically done by the security consultant. They can create some scenarios and then assess how likely they are to happen and what the impact will be on the organization, which is the output. A risk assessment can also be done by an internal department of your customer. Uh, we often see projects where no risk assessment is carried out and you must be aware of this. They're not mandatory. Um, uh, this will require you, you, know, you to make some sort of judgment call about the risk based on your experience and your common sense. Risk assessments also differ from security surveys. 
um, which is something to be uh, aware of as well. Security surveys uh, where a consultant may look at the overall physical condition of the building and from a much higher level approach. So we need some input then, okay? And be before we come to the zoning model, uh, we have to think about that input and where that input may come from. And typically, it comes from the customer. So we have to think about the customer's demands. The customer's demands can change greatly depending on many things. It can, it can change depending on the sector in which your customer sits or how far along the journey they are, whether they're procuring a new system or they're doing a replacement or upgrade. If your customer's a museum, for example, they might not want to have any technology in sight with any LEDs on display. If they're a company that is worried about uh, renewable and, and consumable energy, they may want to have low energy uh, systems in place. So it can greatly differ uh, depending on the, uh, on the client that you're working with. And, you know, lastly, our, our, our other input that we have to take into account is always the architect's design. And therefore, from the architect's design, we should have a floor plan, a, a, a layout of the building that we can then take and apply our security design to. The floor plan is typically done by the architect. You know, they should provide you with, a, um, with the, uh, the final schematic. And it's our job as security designers and security professionals to determine um, where we can apply our security measures. We sometimes see that, you know, the architect does not always take into account uh, the security aspect. So it's important that you work in a converged way uh, with the architect so that security is built into the physical layout because often you know the physical layout of the building is our first layer of our security design a good uh, physical building layout can help mitigate uh, mitigate against uh, potential terrorist or outsider um, threats so these are our inputs our risk assessment our customer design, uh, demands and our floor plan. And you can use this input to come up with a security design which meets the demands and the requirements of your customer. Based on this input, we can then introduce you to our security or our zoning model. And we split this into four simple steps and uh, my colleague Anand will shortly take you through uh, and explain in more detail about step one and step two. Um, so, before we do that, um, and before Anand takes over, we'd just like to ask a quick poll question. Um, and it's really, you know, who is familiar with a zoning model and who currently uses something like a zoning model or a layered approach for their security uh, design already? Um, we'd be really interested um, in seeing uh, your, your feedback on that. So we'll just give you a minute or two just to click on your screen you should see that poll question appear um, I think it's quite often dependent on um, you know which uh, which which region you're in or, or how uh, mature uh, you are as a as a uh, security designer okay I think we've had enough time Frank can we see the results okay so that's really interesting so currently 59% uh, of you currently use a zoning model, um, which is great because we feel also that that's the, uh, that's the best way to do things. But for those of you that do, you know, today, hopefully you can get out of which uh, technologies you can apply to that zoning, zoning model. So we'll be talking very uh, detailed about the technologies and the zones. Um, uh, but before we get today, I'd like to hand over to my uh, my colleague Anand, who will take you through um, the first two steps. Anand, thanks, Mike, for the elaborate uh, introduction. Uh, now I'm I'm going to start off with step one, and step one is called a space zoning. And uh, for most of you who are wondering what this abstract term is, I'll simplify it a little bit in this slide and the slides to come. Yeah, space zoning involves schematic overview of zones for your building. The schematic overview will be used to translate into a floor plan. 
And later on in the zoning model, which Blagier, Michael, and myself would touch base upon, we will look at zone transitions and the advanced security measures that comes along with the transitions. Yeah. Personally, for me, space zoning is the most underrated yet most important step there is. And uh, I can tell from experience of handling a melange of end users and consultants alike in the Middle East, quite a lot of people ignore this step and jump directly in positioning the technology or the vendor or the brand uh, right away. But this step lays in the foundation because it's a generic step that involves you in streamlining and seamlessly transitioning to the uh, let's say uh, the technology uh, mapping uh, uh, steps, which is uh, step three and then step four. Yeah. Now let me put this a little more easier by means of an example, so you exactly understand what I'm talking about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an example of an office and the layered approach that Mike explained, wherein we will go through each and every zone, and I will explain what these zones actually are. The first zone is what is called as zone zero or external public zone. This in essence means that it's a public area that is not in control of your company. Something like this, yeah? And then zone one is called as external private space. And that is something that, uh, uh, that is in control of the company, but it is easily accessible for the public. Like for instance, a parking lot. So this is what is called a semi-public, all right? And then you have zone one, which is uh, zone two, sorry, ex internal public space. This means basically the public space such as the reception area. So zone two is often freely accessible for the public during working hours. Hence, this is semi-private. And zone three or the internal non-working space contains hallways, meeting rooms, cafeterias, and other areas inside your building where people aren't actually doing the work. And zone four, is internal working space. It is the place where work is actually being done or supposedly meant to be done. Not sure if it happens these days, but nonetheless, that's gonna look something like this. Again, this, uh, this is the private space. Zone five is what is called as restricted working space. It is a work area which isn't freely accessible for all employees, like a laboratory or an area for which you need special safety training, an R&D facility or a documentation area. A documentation area, it can be anything, because this is basically a critical zone, all right? And last but not certainly the least is zone six, which is a restricted non-working space. Now, this is the non-working area with restricted access. This could be an IT room or a technical room with critical installations, all right? Now, uh, for our company, it, uh, it, it looks something like this. Uh, but in this situation, we have integrated each zone, but there are also situations where not all zones will be present in the building. So it is not obligated to use all zones in situations. Now, let me translate this into a flow plan so that, again, we simplify things a little more. So now let's look at a typical flow plan that involves quite a lot of different types of zones, something like this. And what we will do, let's map these zones into this flow plan. So what you do, you start with zone zero, you know, the public space, zone one, zone two, and now you're gonna enter into the private space, which is zone three and zone four, and then into the critical space, which is zone five and zone six, yeah? Again, it's, it's literally a layered approach, like Mike said, because you're going from a public space into a semi-private to a private, and then finally into you know your critical spaces little bit uh, the you can use this analogy like an onion uh, you so you go layer by layer and the, the deeper you go the denser the layers are which means later on when you apply the technologies and when you apply the advanced features you know how to transition and how to choose which technology to choose and where to choose you know so this like i said in the outset is the foundation so you do this process it helps you pretty much in nailing the technologies and the advanced security measures at a later point in time, yeah? That said, this is just the first step. Step two involves getting the zoning right or in potentially understanding the possible flaws in, in the flow plan. And what better a way to look at it than looking at a real-time example. Now, this is a typical flow plan, all right? Something that we did the exercise a little earlier. Now, let's look at some examples, real-time examples, 
of how things might not work and what you can potentially do. Now, if you look at the door uh, earlier, there was a door from the reception area directed directly inside the restrooms. Now in this example, that door is missing. So in this particular example, what can potentially happen is a visitor can get inside the reception area or somebody can bring in a courier or a delivery person who is not supposed to go anywhere apart from the reception area. Now he can have, uh, uh, you know, there might be nature's calling that would come at any point in time and he would want to use the restroom at that point in time. But since there is no door that points towards the restroom, he will have to do a zone transition, an unwarranted zone transition from one zone to the other just to uh, get inside the restroom, all right? Now, again, it talks about the coordination a security designer can potentially have with the architect. And if the coordination goes well, which is not always the case, then you can mitigate such scenarios. Now, let's look at another nice example wherein uh, a visitor comes in inside, uh, and, and this is something that typically happens. He, he, he would definitely want to the good meeting room to have a discussion with you. And if this meeting room is, let's say, in a zone uh, that, is, is, uh, that is, let's say, uh, not in, in, in a semi-private area, then again, that poses challenges from a, a zone transition standpoint. Last but not the least, this is my personal favorite uh, example because this is a classic case wherein uh, you would finish a meeting as a visitor and you'd like to access the restroom, but there is a door that prevents you from going into the restroom, which means it's basically another zone transition that you will have to make. And the other possibility of you going to the restroom is going all the way to the reception area to access the restroom. Now, again, if, there are co if there's coordination between the architect and the consultant, or if there is complete understanding of zoning, then you can mitigate this potential scenario. Now bear in mind, these are just some generic examples. This doesn't mean that it would completely fit your project or your site or your office facilities, but these are some ideas or concepts that you can have in your mind in the event you get to collaborate with your end users or architects so that you can share these ideas with them. Yeah. Now let me hand it over to Blagé, who's going to talk about my personal favorite portion of this presentation, which is about mapping the technologies. Blagé, please take it away from here. Thank you, Anand, for a brief introduction to this part. So let's go through all zones transition and let's start from zone zero to zone one. So if we look at the entering zone zero into one, which is from public space into our car park, what kind of technology we can use to manage the transition between zones? We can use, for instance, an intercom for visitors. For employees, we can use a long range reader which works based on the ultra high frequency and combi cards which uh, works in the same te technology and for instance with my furthest fire in one plastic case. This, te this technology can support read tags or stickers up to 10 meters. It's also possible to apply here an NPR camera to open the barrier based on license plate. This can be linked to the person within the access control system to allow automatically entry and design time. And now is the time to ask you again. I'm really curious what will be your answers. The question is, what kind of technology do you use for parking purpose? It's NPR, long range reader, normal card reader, or maybe intercoms. What is the most popular? Okay, let's see in the answers. So the most important, uh, the same like uh, NPR and long range reader is the same and is on the same place. Thirty one person uh, reply in this way. Uh, it's also a very uh, popular normal card reader. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, also, intercom is uh, is popular. Okay, so let's go further. Uh, let's take a look at the moment uh, to the floor plan. This is the place where we can apply those technologies like intercom, long range, uh, long range reader, card reader, and license plate reader. And what about the transition from zone one to zone two? In other words, from our car park, which is an external private space, to internal public space. At the front door, and at the supplier entrance, we can use again an intercom for visitors and suppliers. And for instance, online card reader for employees. 
If the front door is an electrical sliding door, we can also use a door sensor to enter the building. Of course, the door sensor is disabled after business hour or holidays, when the building is not in use, such as bank holidays. Good access control system can use security levels or time schedules to automatically regulate the functionality of the door sensor. And let's take a look again to the floor plans. There are the two places where we can apply the zone transitions and use almost the same technology like intercom, card reader, and also motion sensors. Now let's take, um, let's take a move on to reception area. And if we are here, we can introduce some smarter way of entering into zone three. We could have a normal card reader or on turnstiles or speed gates. In this way, employees could use their access card and visitors could obtain a visitor pass from reception. But it's also possible to use a smart reader which works with mobile credentials. Visitors can be pre-announced with QR codes sent to their phones, a bit like a boarding pass for airports. Or use a mobile credential to work with blood to flow energy and NFC. And tearing is done free in this way can create a smarter impression to visitor and does not require any inter interaction with reception, which is very important. Using a multi-tech reader with both technologies like QR codes, RFID, mobile, it's possible to use a normal access card, mobile credential or QR codes in the same time. When a visitor badge is presented onto the reader, the access system can also notify their host that they have just arrived on site. And this is the place where we can apply these technologies onto the speed gates or turnstiles. The next zone transition is between zone three and four. It is entering into private working space. This area is still secure and we need to manage authorization. However, it's not a critical area. Here we can use again a regular card reader, but you might also want to use a hands-free person reader. This will give over a meter reading distance and be more flexible for doors where we need to allow for people with disabilities or for example, staffs that have items to carry. This reader also can use ultra high frequency technology. We could use a door sensor like zone one, but only in out direction as well. It's also possible to use wireless locks for the, these types of door as the, they are low level security doors. These locks are battery powered and they are able to act in the same way like normal wired doors. This typically is cheaper option because no cabling is required at the door and the single hub can con control up to 16 locks within a specified distance. And where's the places where we can apply those technologies? You can see on these floor plans. So this is a transition from zone three to zone four. So now we are going one leper upper into restricted working space. So it may be necessary to implement additional security measures. It's possible that a card and pin reader will ask for a valid badge and, and the person pin number. Now, we could have a two action to perform. The additional pin verification means that if the person car card is lost or misplaced it and falls into the wrongs, the area is still secure. Okay, so you may feel that this is not enough and or maybe you want to introduce a biometric reader for these last two zones. A good access control system will allow to operator, the operator to manage the biometric data and user templates from a single front end without having to operate a different system for the biometric reader. So I think that is time to ask you for a third time. And the pull question is, do you use a multi-factor authentication reader for your critical room? Okay, good. 62 persons uh, just said that they used, which is very good. Uh, it makes sense. Of course, uh, the 38 uh, said no. So uh, I hope that after this session, you will consider to use, for instance, uh, this kind of technology and security additional security measures to, to allow person to a restricted area. And I hope that this session will be helpful for you to, to manage them. So where's the places to, for instance, to apply this card plus pin reader or biometric reader? 
you, you can see on this floor plan, it's uh, access to, for instance, to laboratory and to airlock. And lastly, going into the most secure zone is transition, which Anand mentioned, it's called restricted not working space. Here we can apply an another verification level with biometric reader, for instance, um, three factor authentications. Only the most intelligent system can manage three factor authentication on a single device. This means having to present all three biometric, card, and PIN in order to gain an access to this area, or a combination of these three. You may also feel that the finger only is enough for this area, but this would be based on your risk assessment and different customer demands. Furthermore, any good system will work with not just on one type of biometric, but many, including, for instance, facial recognition. We can use also a wireless server cabinet logs as well, and manage it from one software but we still have a small potential risk to other this. Even if we, if we apply facial recognition reader in this type of rooms, there is often a little or very few people around to self-police. We cannot guarantee that unauthorized person has not taken into the server room. So the final technology we could introduce into people counter, for instance. This way we can create an alarm when too many people uh, are in the zone or we count number that is not in line with access reads. So let's try to apply this to our floor plans. This is the typical place when we can apply those technologies like three factor biometric, facial recognition, and for instance, cabinet logs plus people counter feature. And now uh, we can move to the final step, which is which is to see if there are additional security measures needed within the zones or to further increase the security level of the overall system. And I would like to uh, give a floor to Mike again. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Blaje and Anand. Really, uh, really interesting um, steps there, taking us through uh, one to three. So hopefully now you get a good um, idea of um, the type of technologies that you can apply for the zone transitions. But, you know, a good access control system like AOS and other enterprise level access control systems all have uh, additional features um, inside the system that we can apply. And we're just going to pick out a few to look at and we can't possibly uh, look at them all. Um, but we feel that these uh, are some of the key ones uh, for you to take away with today. Um, so number one, Blaget's just covered sort of additional uh, verification using, uh, potentially using biometric technologies when we were looking at zones five and six um, uh, with the uh, restricted working space and restricted non-working space. We can also think about applying uh, time schedules and there's a number of places and a number of methods where we can apply time schedules It's not only to unlocking doors and applying them to door sensors We can apply time schedules to access rights and to people and we can also apply them to individual card readers um, As well, which I'll cover in a minute We can think about anti-passback and again, there's two or three different types of anti-passback um, there's the uh, traditional um, local anti-passback. We can think about a global anti-passback rule or more of a zonal anti-passback rule. And all three can be really um, important to apply um, in the right places. Um, it might be necessary that you need an airlock um, in your system design. Uh, in our floor plan that we've been referring back to, um, there's a potential for an airlock uh, to be used uh, because we need to uh, keep our laboratory area clean and we'll cover that um, shortly. Um, and then a couple of really nice features that I know Anand uh, really enjoys talking about. Uh, the manager first rule, um, which uh, as I said Anand can take you through, and the two man rule as well. Both really nice features which we'll explain in a little bit more detail. Um, in a few minutes. So there's just six that we've picked out to, uh, to, to, to discuss in a little bit more detail. So as I said, um, additional verification is, um, is any combination of the above. We've already discussed 
the measures um, in uh, uh, stages or zones five and six. Uh, but combining um, two or three of these methods of identification, we can um, we can achieve additional uh, verification. Typically, we do that by combining something you have, i.e. Uh, an access card or an access badge, RFID technology typically, something you know, like a PIN number, or something you are, like a, uh, like a biometric template, whether that's a finger, vein, palm, iris, or facial rec, any of those uh, can be combined to give you the additional uh, factor authentication for verification purposes. If we think about time schedules then and the different types of time schedules, this can really allow us to automate our system. Um, a few examples where we can apply a, a time schedule, for example, is on door two, uh, on zone two. During business hours, the front door can be set to automatically open to allow visitors and employees into the reception area where they're faced with their turnstiles or reception desk to sign in or to use their smart credentials um, to access uh, through and pass through that zone. But equally, for something like a zone four, we could use it for a hazard stock room where there's a card and a pin reader, and we can schedule using a time zone when the pin is required. So we might say, for example, during normal business hours, uh, you may only have to present your access control card, um, but after business hours, you have to present your card and your PIN. And we can do that with biometric technology as well. So we can be really flexible um, using time schedules. As I said, referring back to our floor plan, applying time schedules there to our reception doors so that they're automatically open. We can also do it um, with the supplier entrances as well um, in conjunction with our intercoms. Anti-pass back then. So as I said, there's a couple of different types, a couple of different flavors of anti-pass back, but I think probably the most common, commonly, commonly used and where we can apply it to our floor plan is uh, at stage two to three, going through our turnstile areas. Um, you know, it can be programmed so that when an authorized person badges through the turnstiles, they must always have to badge out. Uh, before trying to re-enter. And this stops anyone sharing a badge with an unauthorized person. Um, and that's really important. Um, you may think that, you know, it's okay to do that. But if we think about in an emergency evac situation or in a fire roll call situation, it's critical that inside our access control data for reporting purposes and for audit purposes that the data inside our access control is accurate so when you run your presence list if people are sharing cards we're not going to have an accurate representation of the people um, inside our building and what areas or zones they are currently located and that could cause a real danger um, for uh, your fire marshals or the emergency services uh, when trying to evacuate the building and again, typically we can apply this for our zone two going into zone three, applying it with our turnstiles in conjunction with a smart technology reader um, to give you that additional uh, security around um, our fire and our evac. And then finally from me, uh, I'd just like to talk to you about the airlock. Um, so an airlock uh, can be used to make sure that only one person at a time can enter a certain room or enter through a certain uh, corridor, for example. And it can make sure that in a series of doors, only one can be open um, at the same time. With many systems, airlocks are only really possible with lots of complicated wiring using inputs, outputs and relays, and it can get really messy. Uh, with a good access control system like AOS, you know, you should be able to do and uh, create airlocks using software. Um, however, this could mean that if the server is unavailable, that the airlock will fail. And that's why it's important that when you think about your security design and what products you can use, that you use uh, true peer-to-peer -peer functionality at controller level. So that if the server is offline, your airlock will fully function independently of the server. So peer-to-peer -peer is something we can talk to you in a little bit more detail um, about afterwards if you need to uh, understand what that actually means. But in this way, we can apply an airlock to our lab doors um, so that we can ensure that the area remains clean 
and that no contamination is passed into our lab to secure a clean, safe working uh, environment. Uh, just handing back over to Anand now to take you through um, the last few slides. Anand. Thanks, Michael. So um, we're going to talk about the last two additional features, starting with manager first. And like uh, Mike mentioned, manager first, I think is an interesting and cool feature. And for the sake of making this example a little more fun, of course, I'm going to explain the examples to you. And let's presume that I need access into this hazard room which has gamma rays and in the event there is maximum exposure, I get turned into the Incredible Hulk. Um, and now let's look at the example, what is gonna happen. So I am there, I get inside the laboratory and then I would like to get inside the hazard room, but that's gonna be only possible if my manager escorts me and presents the card first and hence the name manager first. Then I can, I have the leeway to get inside the hazard zone and then I do the work that I'm supposed to do. I get outside, my manager leaves the laboratory. Then even if I want to get inside the hazard zone, I won't be allowed to get inside, all right? And uh, if you're wondering why Bruce Banner turned into Incredible Hulk, that's cause they didn't have an access control system supporting this feature. Now on a serious note, it is important for you to know that any good access control system should have the flexibility because this is pretty much an idea that you have in your head. But a good access control system provides you the leeway to convert an idea and translate it into a good functionality that you can potentially use in circumstances like this. Again, I'd like to iterate what Mike said. These are some of the features and there's quite a lot that you can potentially do, yeah? Now let's look at where we can apply this technology in a critical area. Now, if you take a hazard zone, it is recommended that you use a combination of a two factor authentication reader, which is a card and pin reader along with manager first or only with manager first, depending on uh, the variables that the client offers from a budget and, fun and, 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 and functionality standpoint. Now let's look at another example, two man rule. And in this example, I'm gonna talk about uh, a generic, uh, but yet an important example again, wherein uh, somebody who is not from the IT, for instance, let's say some, some sales guy would like to access a server room for whatever purposes. And there is always a risk of allowing, let's say, even if they are internal employees, allowing certain people into a place like a server room because they can potentially get access to information they're not supposed to get, which can cause uh, quite a bit of harm. So in this case, let's, let's presume an employee would like to get into the server room. He or she presents the badge, but then they cannot get inside the room because they will have to be escorted or assured uh, uh, with an IT employee who will then so I present the badge or the, he or she presents the badge and then the IT employee also presents the badge and hence the name two man rule. Now this can be done in a specific time period with certain combinations. It can even be more people if you want to have it, but it gives you again, the flexibility of having an oversight in an area like the data center, which is a critical area. Now, if I put this in practice, I apply this at a server room then you, ha you can, or it is recommended to use a biometric authentication like what Blasier mentioned in conjunction with the two man rule with the and or or combination again, depending on the variables and the, and the suggestions you have uh, from, from the client. Now, this brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, and I'd like to quickly summarize. Before I summarize, let me ask you uh, a poll question. And that poll question is, is basically about, do you think these advanced security features will help you in your projects? And I'm curious to understand uh, because, uh, and, 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 and of course, uh, all these uh, polls are completely anonymous. So please feel free to share your honest feedback because we deem it very important to enhance our learn sessions potentially in the future, if any. Oh, so I get an overwhelming response. Okay, that's nice to know. Uh, that 86% of the audience feels that 
uh, this is really helpful. Two percent feel no, and eleven percent say maybe. Yeah. So uh, for the ones who deem this is relevant, uh, uh, of course you will have these information later on. And if you have any questions, you know who to reach. And for the ones who don't feel uh, feel that this is relevant, please feel free to reach out to us. And if there are additional features that you'd like to know, I'll be happy to help you with that. Or Blagier and Mike would also do the same. Uh, this brings us to the end. I'm going to quickly summarize what we saw. Step one, we, we learned about the, 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 the space zoning process. Step two, we got the zoning right. And three and four, we mapped the technologies onto the zone, zoning model so that you could have zone transitions and you looked at additional security measures. And what these four steps or these pretty easy, simple four steps does in hindsight is it gives you the balance of having uh, the cost requirements, risk requirements, and customer requirements, and you can put it together and give uh, a pretty solid foundation or base for the customer. Yeah, and uh, so this is NEDAP's four-step zoning model. Uh, I hope you found this insightful and utilitarian. And if you have any questions, we welcome feedback. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>